this young man. Yes, he is. Yes, this is. I think this is a great project too, John. You know, this is the Library of Congress, and we're trying to record World War II vets' thoughts. Anyone involved in World War II, it's not just the veterans. Oh, yeah. So, future generations will realize what you went through, uh -huh. the good and the bad. Yeah. So, yeah. now let's see, let me just put down, today is April 18th, 2003. Mm -hmm. And give your entire name if you could, John, just for the... John Ernest Dean, or John E. Dean, I don't care which. Is that thing on right now? Or? Yes, it is. Oh, it is. Yes, it is. Straight on you. Straight on me. Yeah, it's... Yep, you're showing good. Okay. So. All right, John. Basically, how old are you now? Well, I'm 83 now. So you no, were I'm born. 1919. 1919. May the 21st. Okay. We were married June the 6th, 1940. Oh, so. Well, let me ask you, let's just start out with that. Did you feel the need to get married because you felt you might have to go into the service? No, or? no. We just decided we would get married. And uh, I was a baker route salesman uh, for Sunbeam out of Johnson City, retail, house to house. And uh, <clears throat> they had 26 routes. And I took the smallest one and made it the biggest one that went out of there, ever went out of there. How <laughs> did I work? And then I, I you know, I'm, I'm 50, so I'm not a, I'm not a youngster. Now, I remember home delivery for milk. Yeah. I remember home delivery for eggs. Yeah. But I don't remember home delivery for bread. No kidding. No. Bread, pies, cake. Well, anyway, uh, we went on our vacation in December of 1941, weeks vacation, and Ann and I went to New York and uh, was visiting my uncle on 77th Street in Brooklyn, New York. And I was trying to get Gene Autry, my idol, and all I could hear was yakety yak. And all at once I stopped and they said, the Japs had bombed Pearl Harbor. Well, I'm telling you that uh, changed our whole life. Well, I was a man, I was gonna enlist. And I started crying because she just became pregnant for our first child. Boy. And uh, <clears throat> so, but she lost it, but, uh, but she got pregnant again. I thought it'd be a pretty nasty thing to do. Well, I went into war plant because they took the routes off the road uh, in Westover, making Hamlet's standard propellers for the Air Force. And I worked myself up all the way from uh, Califlex grinding all the way on up to inspection. I had the best and the most best paying job on the road or on the line. Then in 1944, that song came out. There's a star spangled banner waving somewhere, and that hit me between the eyes. I did. I told Anne. I said, I don't want to leave you or our son. We had our son, John Allen, at that time. And I believe he was 18 months old or something when I, when I uh, uh, told Ann, I said, uh, when they called me up, I'm going to enlist. So, so let me interrupt you for a moment. Yes. Because you were married and had a child, you were based, you were deferred, I believe, or were you, want, were you a deferral late? I mean, would that keep you from one of the last of being Yeah, and then being at a uh, final inspector at Remington Rand, I wouldn't have had to go. I see. A very, you had a very important uh, yeah. war job. I see. Well, I had an awful fight with them down to the West End Armory because they said, you can't go. And I said, why can't I go? And they said, you're a final inspector. And I said, you can get a cripple to do my job. I said, you send him to school and teach him uh, depth gauges, vernier calipers, micrometers. I says, I'm sitting them down half the time. And he said, well, if you're bound and determined to go, we can't stop you. And I said, I know that. Why do you think I'm giving you a hard time? So they had me take my papers down to a Marine lieutenant. And he, uh, I told him I wanted the Navy and I want to go immediately. What's the matter with the Marine Corps? I says, nothing, sir. I said, you're a good outfit. But I said, you know something, sir? I says, I happen to be uh, enlisting. I says, I don't have to go. And if I can't get the branch out, I'll go home. 
I thought he was going to blow his stack. He got so red, oh, I thought he was going to have a heart attack. Mad. Oh, he hit my papers with a stamp, threw them in my face, I picked them up off the floor. So he had big letters there, amphibious. So anyway, I took my boot training at Samson, G unit. That's just, uh, just by Geneva? Yes. At Seneca Lake? Yeah, but I wound up in regimental headquarters, G unit. And company 537 G18 upper. And uh, so after that, I was shipped to Philadelphia Navy Yard for fireman's training, then shipped all the way across to uh, Oakland to uh, the naval base there. Well, how big, was uh, Oakland bigger? I know Philadelphia must have been a substantial Navy yard. Yeah. Was Oakland bigger or? It, it was a big one. Yeah. Uh, I don't know too much about uh, Philadelphia because we got there 2300 on uh, Saturday night and they told us to show up and don't show up until 0800 Monday morning. I said to the bosun mate, I said, where's the OD shack? And he told me and I went up and saluted the officer and I said, sir, I said, I'd like an out of bounds pass. He says, where to, son? I said, Binghamton. Oh, he says, I can't give you one for there. He said, uh, Scranton, as far as I can give you one for. I says, what are we supposed to do? We just came back from Bootley. I said, none of us got any money. Well, he says, we have no room for you. You'll have to do the best you can. Wow. So I just went out of there and went down, bought a ticket and came as far as Scranton and transferred down to another one, came home. We had 12 hours and went back. I was <laughs> <laughs> I stood mustered all 800 on Monday morning. You were there. I was there. Okay. And uh, so now how did you get to Oakland from Philadelphia? Train? Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, bus. 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 Yeah. Really? Bus. Yeah. Wow. See, I took. I mean, that oh, uh, Oakland to. I'm, I'm sorry, Philadelphia to Oakland. Oh no, we went back to Samson. From Samson, we went by train all the way through Chicago, and uh, while well, we even wound up in Cody. Wyoming and all those places. Okay, okay. Wound up in Oakland, uh, Amphib Base, or not Amphib, Naval Base. And they put me as a, as a messenger on the base. And I rode one of those motor, motor scooters when it would start. If it wouldn't start, I had to run for a mile and deliver messages. So that only lasted for a week or less. And then we shipped from there down to our Amphib Base in San Pedro, California. And that's where the fun began. And they used to lay awake nights, I think, uh, giving, uh, uh, thinking up things for us uh, people that was amphibious to do. I mean, we, we wound up with Army training, Navy training, Marine training, Judo, you name it, we had it. And we put our first ship, APA 139, USS Broadwater, in commission there. Brand new ship. It was an attack transport. We carried 1,600 troops, 538 in the crew. Good size ship. Yeah, 586 feet six inches long, weighed 11,800 tons. <laughs> uh, I was uh, striking for machinist mate and uh, fireman, and I made fireman first class. I had. 3.8.6 out of a possible 4.0, the highest score of any of them. Like okay, a technical test or? No, 190 some questions to right. make it. <laughs> I gotcha. And, uh, what to do in certain situations? Yes. In uh, the equipment? Yeah. Well, your, me your memory is uh, excellent now. I'm sure it was uh, just as good then. Yeah, it was, thank God. I've got a lot to be thankful for. But anyway, uh, we, um, let's see. Put it in commission, I'll never forget Captain Herring. He was a four-striper captain. And he had us all standing at attention on deck and gave us a good, you know, how great we was and so forth. Uh, we straightened up. Uh, we carried 26 landing craft, I believe it was, and the boat crews, instead of taking an hour to get them in the water, I think it took 10 or 12 minutes after they Trained something like that. That's I wasn't funny. in the boat crew. I, uh -huh. uh, I could have, 
gone in there and became a motor Mac third class. Uh, I'd like that for uh, getting a uh, passing mark on 13 questions, but I wouldn't do it because those landing craft uh, <laughs> hitting the beaches and Tricky. something else. And, uh, well, you lose so many guys there, you know, because they're shelling the daylights out of you. Well, anyway, Captain Harry, he gave us a good talk. We finished and started to go away and turn around. Oh, he says, fellas, I forgot to mention one thing. He says, remember, this is a one-way ticket. Don't expect to come back. Can you imagine a captain telling that? If we'd have been close enough, we'd have jumped ship, I'm sure of what, 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 what Did he really think that Yes, was? and his prediction is all about getting true. We went from there to Frisco. We picked up 800 civilians and uh, military personnel and took them to Hawaii. Well, we enjoyed Hawaii for two or three weeks, and we didn't know what was going on. And all at once, we set sail. I was on watch in the engine room. I came to outside and I look at What in the world are we out in front for? Fifteen ship convoy and we're the flagship. You're the point, you're the flagship. And I said, what's going on? They said, well, we're the only ship that has a four-striper captain. Some of them are only Lieutenant JGs. They didn't have captains. So he was really leading the convoy. Yeah. We had 1,600 troops and there was 15 ships, 15 or 17, I'm not sure which. So you're steaming from, from uh, Pearl Harbor or yeah, what? Yeah, we were going into the Battle of Luzon in the Philippines. Yeah, oh, okay. And this was what, 1944? Five. 45. And uh, we was, uh, I went in in 44, but I mean, okay. this was to back the liberation of the Philippines. Right. And uh, so anyway, we had, all we had for escort was two PCs and one DE. And, uh, my gosh, Jap subs came in on us and they went to work. And, but one sub got a torpedo off and got us. Your ship? Our ship. And we had 1,600 troops down there in the hole, but praise the good Lord. <laughs> it didn't pierce the hull, it was a glancing blow. I see. And we lay dead in the water all night long. I know because I was one of the engineers and we had to work all night long. So it did, it did stop the ship as far oh, as... Oh yeah, knocked everything out in the engine room. Okay. And uh, so then we got uh, underway at uh, just to start to get daylight the next morning. Convoy was long gone and he tried to cut through Jap infested waters to get to convoy sooner and another Jap some part of the torpedo, but he missed us, thank God. He just missed the bow. You can imagine, we'd have been out there, it had been, oh, think of it, 1,600 plus, there's 538 in the crew. You've got uh, almost 2,200 guys out there, you know, right. how many of us would have made it? Right. Well, we caught the convoy, and we let her down through um, San Bernardino Straits into Manila Bay. We was the first convoy to come through uh, the San Bernardino Straits into the bay after the Great Naval Battle. After the uh, they bombarded the, the Philippines? The, the, yeah, they, they caught the Jap fleet in there and what a time they had. Oh, and uh, they caught the fleet right in port. Yeah, so uh, it was, they told me, now this is hearsay, I, I, I didn't count them actually, they said that there's 102 Jap ships sunk in the harbor that stuck up. Well, I know that we, I got pictures of some of them, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, I, uh, I do know the fact that we had to anchor out a mile, and of course our 1600 troop, we hit the beach. I can show you, I got the picture where I hit the beach, on the con, where the Conjung building was tipped on its side like that. I remember saying, dear Lord, don't let that fall over on me when I'm going through, and I'm falling over all this rubble and everything and there was a jeep up there with an army guy there and uh, he says hey sailor you want to ride and i says it'd be better than breaking my neck on this he took me <laughs> out to roselle Avenue, the main street in manila you know uh -huh. and, uh, so anyway uh what a time we had i was at santa tomas prison where the japs tortured all those thousands of filipinos it was in the walled city that i heard how true it is, I don't know. It took the British six days to 
break through the wall in the late 1800s with their guns and it took our guns six minutes. Now I don't know how much truth there is in that, but I do know it was a mess. And they pushed the Japs out of the city, so there was still uh, a lot of stuff going on around there. And were you surprised at how easily, though, they were able to uh, displace the Japanese from Manila? Yes, because uh, it, it was just brute strength. I mean, uh, those poor, those poor guys. Uh, one thing that really impressed me was we, <clears throat> the Red Cross was there with a donut. I think it was a swallowing donut. Mm -hmm. And a glass of Kool-Aid, a little cup of Kool-Aid. And we stood in line, four wide, about a block and a half or two blocks long, waiting for that because it was something from home. And the soldiers had come down with their, with their uh, <coughs> uh, rifles slung over their shoulder and walk up and talk with us and get their bite and then visit a little bit and say, well, I guess I better go up on the line and fight Japs again. And it was just another thing. Wow, well, kind of a, a kind of almost a comical scene, really. Yeah. So anyway, uh, we, uh, we left there and on the way back, <clears throat> the USS Comfort, the hospital ship, was going along all lit up one night and a Jap two side plane smashed right into her. Kamikaze? Uh, kamikaze. Now, they had no business of touching her because all hospital ships were supposed to go out, uh, be lit up and go on, and nobody pestered them. Well, he done a mess on her, and she sent out an SOS. And it was our ship, APA 139, USS Broadwater. We went to her rescue, and she radioed back, followed her into Guam. She thought she could make it alone. Well, I got off watch at 0800 in the morning, went topside up on the forecastle. The smoking lamp was lit, so I went up there to uh, have a smoke, and, uh, in those days I did. And uh, so she lay off our port side, and she was a, she was a mess, burned out, hulk, and it killed a lot of people, you know. And uh, a buddy of mine, who was a radio, one of the radio men, he was cursing the Japs. And he said, we fixed them. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, if I tell you, don't tell nobody. Well, I didn't tell nobody for 20 years. But it seems that uh, it wasn't 15 minutes after that uh, plane smashed into the USS Comfort that the, the uh, aircraft carriers were notified all through the Pacific. And they sent up every single aircraft they had looking for Jap hospital ships. They found three of them. There was nothing left. Wow. So the Japs paid heavy for that. Right. That never got back. To the I understand. That's not something that uh, no. would but make the I mean, we had to do it because sure. they were maniacs. We'd never fought maniacs before. We took very few prisoners. They'd either kill you or you had to kill them or they'd kill themselves. And it was something else. It's like the terrorists you got today, you know. They thought it was an honor. Crazy Japs. But anyway, then uh, my mother's dying of cancer, and they tried to get me home. Back in Binghamton, or in back Binghamton, in Johnson City. Yes, Binghamton. Oh, yes. And uh, they tried to get me home, and they wouldn't do nothing about it, so they contacted our congressman, Edwin Arthur Hall, 37th Congressional District. And he sent an order to get me home. So we pulled into our Amphib base in San Pedro, California. I went to the Red, or, yeah, Red Cross office over there. My officer told me to go over there and so forth, get straightened around, and take my gear and so forth, and 30-day emergency leave from the ship. So I went over and he told me, he says, well, you're getting a 30-day emergency leave to go home, my mother's dying. I said, yes, and the officer told me all that. I said, what do you got flying east? He says, nothing. I says, come on, they're taking off in the east all the time. You know that. <laughs> yeah, he says, I can't get you on it. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm just a little old amphibious lad. <laughs> I wasn't the officer. And uh, so I says, well, I says, that's a bummer, that is. He said, what do you mean, son? 
Well, he says, for your information, sir, I only draw $14 every two weeks. I says, everything else goes to my wife and my son, who are having it rough living on my wages. I was part of in first class at the time. And he, uh, so I says, I'm going to be home a month as near as I can figure out. I'm not going to get another pay until October or so before the, they catch up with me. And I said, sponging on them for 30 days, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, that man opened his desk drawer, took out his checkbook, and wrote me a check and handed it to me. Will this help you, son? A hundred bucks. Wow. In 1945, that I'm hundred sure. bucks was as good as six or seven hundred. Absolutely. Very generous. Yes. I couldn't believe it. Well, then, you aren't going to believe this either. But I rode from San Pedro, California, to Binghamton, New York, on the trains, two of them, one as far as Chicago and then the other one on through. Five days and four nights for 42 bucks, Whew. service man's rate. Well, I came home, it was wonderful being a, a father and husband for uh, a few weeks. And uh, also, it was sad because my mother was just living to see her one and only child. Oh, so you were an only child? Yes. Wow. And uh, so, uh, my sad third day. Sad and happy occasion, as you said, yeah. Yes, yeah, sad, uh, sad. How and old was your mom? She, let's see. She was old when I got married, uh, when I was born. My dad, I think, was 42 and she was 37. And I was 25 when I went into service, so I was an old man trying to keep up with those young guys, you know, but I've done it. I Sounds done it. like you did. And uh, so, anyway, <laughs> you know, she, she must have been, my Six dad died just a month to the day before Pearl Harbor. And she died uh, in, well, 1945 it was. And uh, so after that, I was shipped with sealed orders. I had to report to Pier 92 in New York and put me on a captured German battleship guarding prisoners. I had the 0800 to 1200 watch every morning. And the third morning I was down there, a guy came down. He says, your name Dean? I said, yes. He says, I came to relieve you. You wanted in the OD shack. So I went up and saluted the OD. He says, yes, your mother's dying. She'll probably be dead before you get home. Here, he says, here's your pass. Put on your dress clothes, grab your toothbrush, leave your gear here, and shove off and be back in 10 days. So I did, so did him. I came back there, and they shipped me over to Brooklyn Navy Yard, Flushing Avenue Barracks. I was one of the guards on the main gate. And then one day I was walking down the corridor. It was about four or five stories high. I took up a whole city block, beautiful place. Uh, of course, there was doors like you have here, offices, and all at once I heard somebody say, Sailor, come here. So I turned around, went in, and I saluted him. I said, Sir, you called me? He said, Yes, I did. He says, How would you like to be one of the honor guard for President Truman when he puts <laughs> the FDR in commission? And boy, I'll tell you, the old chest stuck out. And I said, Yes, sir. And he said, You've got it. Why? Because I was proud of my uniform. I always was spick and span. You never, I never took a drink. I saw enough of my father, so I, I, I was too proud of my uniform to slop it up. Right, and they, and they knew that. They, yeah. they could see that you had pride in your, yeah. uh, your service and your yeah. uniform, and yeah. obviously they wanted President Truman to be impressed. Yeah. So well, I quite an honor. One of, I think so. Anyway, I was on the guard for him, and then <clears throat> after a while, they uh, sent me to Bayonne, New Jersey, and I caught another wonderful fighting ship, APA-120, USS Hinsdale. Went through the canal, Panama Canal, back into the Pacific. So many of the islands had always been to uh, Wake, Hawaii, Marshalls, Philippines, Marianas, Palau, Bataan, Corregidor, New Guinea. But these were all under our control by this time. Uh, some, no, not all of them. Okay. Most of them. Right. Uh, Okinawa wasn't, but that, uh, uh, I'll get to that. I know, I know you've got to. Uh, because you know what's coming up, I think, because I mentioned it. But anyway, uh, we left. 
and went back into the Pacific. Well, <clears throat> that most famous picture of World War II of the South Pacific showing five Marines and the Navy corpsman raising the flag on Iwo Jima. Let me interrupt you for a second. I want to make sure we got enough tape because this is uh, certainly very interesting. Thank you. Okay. okay, we got plenty of tape. I want you to catch your breath too, John. <laughs> well, that's all right. <laughs> but anyway, uh, go ahead. So you're now you're back at the Pacific Theater. Yes, but uh, what I wasn't on the now. Don't get me wrong. I wasn't on the PA one twenty when this happened. I was on a guard for President Truman about that time when when the Marines, uh, the five Marines, and the Navy corpsman raised a flag on Iwo, that famous picture, and that flag came off our ship APA-120, USS Hinsdale. And I'm pretty proud of that. You should be. Well, I went on her, and then afterwards we took a suicide plane at Okinawa. And uh, I even have a picture of the ship and the hole in the side of it and everything. I have pictures of Jap ships sunk in the harbor. I have a picture of the Kujang building uh, where I hit the beach. Uh, in the Philippines and in, in uh, Manila. Uh, I have all these things documented so that I know that... Were you, uh, did you enjoy photography or you just... No, I just... Uh, you, well, yeah, I do. I love photography and I, uh, I have a big uh, album, two albums of uh, our beautiful Shimong Valley and the Finger Lakes region and so forth and so on. I'm, really go for that. Yeah, so you have, you have an eye for a good photo. Well, that's what they tell me, yeah. Okay. And, uh, so I was, uh, I was a 40 millimeter anti-aircraft gun. I was on that during 1A landing of troops uh, on general quarters when the ship got hit. I was, uh, I was uh, one of the repair, ship repair crew. And uh, so anyway, uh, we went on there, and finally, on my last trip back to San Pedro, California, uh, the officer of the box says, Dean, he said, uh, will you let me put third class petty officer on you? He says, no test, no nothing. He says, you know more, more uh, than any third class I've got. And he says, nobody has to follow you around. I says, sir, I says, that'd be wonderful. But I says, how many points to get out if I take it? He says, 36. Well, sir, I says, how many points if I stay thirty or stay uh, fireman first class? He said, 32. And I said, sir, I got 32 and three quarters points. I says, I want out just as soon as we hit the beach, sir. Because I says, as you know, sir, I says, my wife's been in the hospital, and my son's been in the hospital under an oxygen tent. And I says, the, the, the uh, bombs have been dropped, the war is over, and I said, I should be there. And, and, uh, so this here. was August of 45? Yeah. Uh -huh. In fact, I got ahead of my story a little bit. I stood in the fallout of the bomb. We dropped on Nagasaki. I was covered with it. Thank God he dropped the bomb or I wouldn't have been here because amphibs go in first. And their suicide planes come after us guys because of our troops. And of course, we had 5 inch 38 on a fantail. We had, I was on a twin 40 on a Starboard side was another twin 40 on the port side, and then was a quad 40 dead center, and then uh, five 20 millimeters on each port and starboard uh, up in the opposite country up that way, and midships. But uh, yeah, it was uh, nip and tuck there for a while, but my golly, we came through. The, they was bound determined it was going to get us, but well, the good Lord is with us, all I can say. And uh, it was quite an experience. I realized that I didn't, I wasn't in, you know, about 21, 22 months, somewhere in there. And guys have been in five and six years, and some of them uh, went through a lot more than I did. Well, you went through a lot. But, uh, I'm glad that I was able to do something for my country. Problem was, I came home, I had shattered nerves, 
and they thought it was going to put me up in the state hospital in Binghamton, New York. It was that bad. Thank God I came out of it. I didn't have to, and I got, finally got straightened around. But it was no picnic. You know, you had seen a lot taking yeah. its toll. Yeah, but uh, I don't know of any veteran that got around more than I did. Could you imagine? I was Hawaii, Marshalls, Philippines, Marianas, Peru, Bataan, Corregidor, New Guinea, Japan. We landed in Sasebo, Japan. And uh, uh, let's see, through the Panama Canal, three times across the continent, and on a guard for President Truman. But the only place you weren't was at the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the Europe and the, the Russian front. <laughs> A lot of places I didn't hit. There's a thousand islands or more in the Philippines to go below them. You did get around. And uh, so, anyway, we, <laughs> our buddy and I went to Hollywood just before we shipped out. Hollywood, California, and spent a whole weekend there, you know. Ed slept and went everywhere, done everything imaginable. They wouldn't let you spend any money. I spent 30 cents for postcards to send home to Ed. And uh, uh, I met some of the stars, and Ida Lupino, Helmut Lantin, Monty Woolley, and Johnny Garfield, and oh, I Was just, Garfield uh, in the service too? I'm not sure. I'm not sure I don't, I'm not sure on that part. But anyway, I prized that pen. It was my pen, but I prized it because she had used it to write my autograph. So I came topside, we pulled into Leyte Harbor, and there's blasting reefs there. Well, that day they happened to have 90 day wonder on there as the OD. And he got his signals mixed up and he started moving ahead and he wasn't supposed to. And one of those charges went off. And I'm sitting up on the forecastle writing a letter. I went right over backwards like that, but it didn't go into the sea. It stopped me, but I lost my pen and everything else. Oh. Just laying there in Leyte Harbor and the world's high man. I says, I'd give anything for that pen because I did Lupino. Ah. <laughs> Oh, brother. <laughs> Ida Lupino, uh, she used that, you know, to write the autograph. Now I've lost her autograph. Oh, boy. And I lost so many of my friends' uh, name and address, and I feel so bad because uh, we had some wonderful, wonderful... Your ships didn't have any reunions after the war? Yeah, APA 120. That's the reason that I found out that she, the was flag. Was your flag. Was the flag. I never knew that until maybe a month ago. And that's been documented. Mm -hmm. And uh, Quartermaster, second class, he documented it. And I've got the article that the AP wrote on it. So I know it's a documented article. And uh, the same way with everything that uh, I, well, when I wrote my memoirs, I said, everything, if I wasn't sure, I put it in there. Well, I'm not quite sure on this. I wouldn't write something that I wasn't sure it was the truth. And that's why they say, they told me there was 102 Jap ships sunk in the harbor that stuck up. Now, I don't know whether how close it was. Right. I know I've got some pictures of them. Right. But that and, was a documented statement or a fact, right? No, I don't know. That yeah. was just told to me. Right. I and, see. Uh, I guess. By uh, somebody, uh, I don't know whether it was an officer or whether it was one of the other guys. But we had wonderful officers. They thought the world of me, and I thought the world of them. They did seem to have a lot of confidence in you. Yeah. And uh, while well, I'd done my best, and I always have, I always tried to do the very best I could. Uh, tried to do what my superiors wanted, the best way I knew how. And uh, I, if uh, people were breathing down my back, it made me nervous. I know at Remington Rand, I was working one day, and the boss was breathing down my back, and I said to him, he says, that your office down there? He says, yeah. I said, you do me a favor. I said, will you go down there and sit down on that chair in your office and put your feet up on the desk and get out of my hair? <laughs> I says, you're making me nervous. This is after the war. No, this is, uh, oh. yeah, this is before the war, before right. I went into the military. I got gotcha. you, I got gotcha. you. So you were always a confident guy. That's right. I said, I know my job and I know what I'm doing. But I says, you breathing down my neck, you're making me nervous. <laughs> he gave me a look and went down. Uh, I've done my job. Well, I guess I did. I went from the lowest position on the barrel line clear to the highest, which is final inspection. 
making more money than anybody else. But I had to go. When that song came out, there's a star-spangled banner waving somewhere. And All right, I'm going to check the tape. Well, I'm gonna, what I want you to do is start thinking about maybe some practical jokes that went on uh, during uh, your service time. Yeah. Those are always interesting, and I'm sure you have a few. Yeah. So let me just check the tape. Okay. No, we're still in good shape. Good. Okay, so John, as I mentioned, was there any practical jokes or how would you pass the time on the ship or when you were uh, on leave? But basically, you, you were, other than your duty in Brooklyn and your duty in Oakland, you were on the ship quite a lot. Yeah. So how would you pass the time? Any well, practical jokes you can maybe tell well, us? I'm not going to watch one. The guys would be playing cards there, this and that. You don't know, want me to... <coughs> play cards. And I was convicted of it. I said, no, I don't play cards. I'm sorry. And, well, then, will you go and find a guitar and sit down and uh, sing country western for us? So I would. I'd borrow a guitar from somebody. Oh, you, you, I know you mentioned you enjoyed Gene Autry. You were uh, a, con you know, you knew how to play the guitar. And yeah, I and sang yodel. And I know one, <laughs> <laughs> one day we, uh, let's see, the three of us went into uh, two parties. Yeah, went into a USO, big place, and up on the podium, or, <clears throat> they had guitars, mandolins, banjo, you name it. I said, I'd like to get a hold of one of them. Nice looking lady came over, she says, uh, welcome sailor, she says, do you want to, uh, or do any of you play anything? And I said, well, I'm in a sort of a New York hillbilly. I says, I do a little guitar picking and yodeling and singing. She says, well, we're going to have a contest, she said. A USO content show in about 20 minutes, and she said, "Why don't you enter?" And I said, "Oh, I said, those Southern hillbillies have beat me out." So she says, "So what? It's three different uh, prizes in each section: first, second, and third for each one." So she said, "Why don't you try?" I says, "Okay." I said, "I might as well." So I got up there, and what was it I sang? When my blue moon turns to gold again, was it, or was it, I'm not sure. And I yodeled afterwards. I came off at first prize and beat the hillbillies and everything else. Five bucks. Well, five bucks back in my yeah. <laughs> 45 is as good as 40 today, though. Substantial law yeah. winning, sure. That's sure, because cigarettes are <coughs> nickel a pack, and more shit, 50 cents a carton. And, uh, uh, of course, I didn't... The only bad habit I had was smoking. I didn't touch booze, that's all enough of that. Talking about, <coughs> they used to really kid me, because they called me reverend and everything else because I wouldn't move. You wouldn't play anymore. cards and you weren't a drinker? So I said, well, uh, they'd come to me and say, how do you do it? And I said, well, I'll tell you if you want to know. I said, my dad was a <coughs> town drunk. I said, he was a wonderful, hard-working man. He honest man, but I said he was an alcoholic. And I said, when I got in my teens, the people in the community wouldn't let their daughters go out with me because I was the son of the town drunk. Wow. And I said, that cut deeper than any night. And I said, uh, I asked God to keep me from it. And I said, so far he's kept his end of the bargain, and I'm keeping mine. Because if I don't take number one, I haven't got to worry about two, three, four, five, and ten and wind up booze hounds like you guys are. And I wouldn't care what their rate was, whether it was an enlisted man or an officer, I'd tell them right to their face. Well, and good. I, I didn't back down on my uh, beliefs or anything because I felt that, that very strongly about it and I wasn't about to get coerced into something that I didn't want to do. Talking about one thing, oh, I'll never forget that. We're going back to the ship uh, from Manila, got back in the landing craft, going back to the ship. The bosun mate, he was about seven sheets of wind. His buddy had got into a bombed out building and they'd got into some sake. Well, they was warned, everybody warned, don't drink any of that, you can go blind. Well, they was, we was packed in there. This was only the 36 footer. We had I think it was 24 36-footers and two 50-footers. 50-footers 
was twin diesel engines and they'd hold a tank or, or a jeep or 50 men and a 36 foot hoodies that bow didn't come down, they got, it was only for personnel. And they had to jump over the side, it was plywood, that's one reason. And they had a, what was it, 20 millimeter gun there, I, a little piece of steel to keep the bullets from hitting. Oh, no way, I said, I'm not going to go in that unless I'm forced to, I'll stay with the chip. And, uh, so anyway, uh, uh, his buddy had stolen the guitar and he sat there and he was dropping me uh, 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 under the... He had your guitar? No. He had his another guitar. Uh, I, don't, I didn't have a guitar anyway. But I, I mean, he'd stole that one out of, <coughs> out of that bombed out building in, the, in Manila. I see. Going, da, 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 da. And he couldn't sing and he couldn't play, you know, and his buddy was standing up there in the coach. He couldn't fall down, he was packed in there, you know. Uh, and I was standing there, I had a... Lieutenant J.G. on this side, and I had a chief on this side, and he was just ahead of us, and he said, the most of mate says to his buddy, shut up. And he never paid no attention, so I reached over and he grabbed it, yanked it out of his hands, picked it up, and boom! Right over his head, and his head went right through the guitar. Wow. And the, and the streaks are hanging off his ears, you know, and he's got a glassy look. And, oh, wow, I'm telling you. So most mates said, well, it's we'll time for a drink. And he pulled a flask out. And when he did, officer says, I want everybody searched on this scow. So they turned to me, oh, Reverend Dean don't have it. I was the only one that they didn't search it. Uh -huh. I don't know anyway around that. But there was, I think they said eight flasks went over the sign, plink, plink, plink. So time to got back to the ship while it was a dry scow. <laughs> But uh, that was one of the comical things that happened. That, that and, is funny, yeah. And, uh, but so many different, oh, uh, another one that was uh, not comical. This buddy of mine, he was a coxswain in a big landing craft. And uh, at Okinawa, I think it was, one of those islands, the Japs were good swimmers. And they'd swim out to a ship a mile away, you know, and they'd load them up with load themselves up with explosives so you can get out there and dive underneath, tuck themselves off and blow a hole in the ship. Kamikaze swimmer. Yeah, <laughs> they're the Jap swimmers anyway, they're crazy. And sometimes they climb the anchor chain and stab an officer if they could get one or anybody they could and dive off and swim back. So they had to patrol, they had to keep the landing craft going back and forth, even though you've anchored a mile long. So one day, one morning, it was about 0300, I think he said, 0230, 0300. Going along, he thought he saw something. There were three guys, see the coxswain, the motor mac, and I guess the gunner. But anyway, the other two guys were asleep. He thought he saw something. He ran the thing in reverse, and when he did, he got a jack. Was swimming back in from a ship. He got him caught in the screws. But then he had to wake the other guys up, and it took him 15 minutes to take it. Get that chewed up Jap out of there and you screw it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you chewed that Jap like you wouldn't believe. So I started kidding him one day and he grabbed me and was all ready to hit me. And he, said, Dang. he woke up then, he said, Dean, he said, he wasn't a good friend of mine. He says, I deck you. And I said, why? Well, he says, I had nightmares. I said, nightmares? Because I says, you chewed up a stinking Jap that would have killed you if he could have got a chance. He said, yeah, I still get him. I hugged him and said, I'll never kid you again, but I said, I can't, I can't believe why that you feel that way, but that, if you feel that way, that's your... Uh, well, at least he was expressing his uh, nightmares to you. Yeah. And, uh, well, well, we all had him, I'll tell you, we all had him, many of them, and uh, scream and yell and... <laughs> Uh, John, you briefly, or I mean, we got time. I'm just, uh, what when you got after the war? Yeah. You came back to Binghamton, and Johnson yeah. City, uh -huh. and you you had some uh, health problems, and you worked your way through those. Yeah. What did you do as an occupation after that? Well, I came home, and so I say I was in a mess, but uh, I was the best actor. The best actor? The best actor it ever was. Is that Happy true? Happy go lucky. Good actor. actor. <laughs> I could go up and get inside. My guts was churning. I see. Churning nightmares. But you meet me, hey, how are you? Yet? You know, and yet I was, my nerves are shot. 
well, I wanted to take a month off <clears throat> and uh, get straightened around, but the fellow that was my supervisor at Sunbeam Bakery, my route supervisor, uh, found out I was home and he says, I want you to go to work for the Hoover Company selling Hoover cleaners. So I went to work five days after I got out of the service and I wasn't fit to go, but I did, selling Hoover cleaners out of the pair store in Binghamton. I was only allowed six cleaners a month to sell. Because there had to be a shortage, I would have been. Yeah, but I had a stack of three by five envelope or a stack of three by five cards like that with people waiting for cleaners. I didn't have to give the demonstration then put put them in the pile, you know. And then when they came in I'd pick, pick the top and off. Good morning, Mrs. Jones, this is Mr. Dean from the third store for Hoover Company. Uh, can I deliver you a new cleaner? We got one in for you. Well, if she said she couldn't take it, I'd say, well, that's all right. Uh, you can get it later, and I'd just slide her down the bottom and take the right. next one. And so <clears throat> six cleaners a month wasn't going to give me that much pay. And uh, I didn't think so. We done, I trained and became a sales and service, and I'd pick up uh, the machines and service them. New belts and grease and I see. And what, was, what was a Hoover going for back then? And back then, Model 27 went for 99.95. Pretty, pretty big investment. Yeah, back in them days. Sure. But uh, yeah, that was that was a good job. We uh, let's see. Yeah, I made more money in picking up and servicing cleaners. I can imagine what they charge to service a cleaner today. We we charge two dollars and a half. Yeah. Plus brushes. Brushes I think was uh, sixty-five cents a, no. Belts are sixty-five cents a piece and brushes I think was a buck, buck and a quarter a piece or something like that. And uh, uh, you know, we clean the bag up for them and we do all this and that and the other and boy, oh boy, I could knock one off while well, some guys knocked them off 15, 20 minutes and I wouldn't, I'd take my time and do the job right. I'd spend at least 45 minutes on one and I'd get 20 or 30 of them a week, you know, besides the cleaners and boy, I had a good... So how long did, were you with the Hoover Company? Uh, let's see, about a year and because of my own stupidity I quit. But then, uh, anyway, it wasn't too long after I started driving for Triple C Distraction in Binghamton, pushing the extra list. Had 157 bus drivers, 47 on the extra list, and I was pushing the list. And if you made your AM and PM show-ups, uh, they guaranteed you 36 hours a week. Well, I think it was one week in all the years I was there that they paid me 36 hours, all the rest I had 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and sometimes 100 hours in a week. Wow. Sometimes work three weeks without a day off. And uh, it was, besides that, I had a panel truck and was doing light trucking. Besides that, it was selling Raleigh products. Anything to make a nickel and... Uh, Raleigh products as sporting goods? No, Raleigh products, uh, vanilla, Sand, ointments, W.T. Raleigh. Okay. Uh, oh, oh, I've seen them in the barber shops. No? No, no, it was from house to house. Let's see, Watkins Products was the oldest. Raleigh worked for Watkins, and then about 100 years ago or so, he left Watkins and started the Raleigh business. And then first, McNesk was Raleigh's chemist, and he worked for Raleigh for 20 years and then built his laboratory is about three blocks away in, in the Freeport, Illinois from Raleigh. <coughs> and I've, I've sold them all. Watkins, Raleigh, McNess. Jeepers, one, jeepers, one, jeepers. One is the other. <laughs> and, uh, Just like for aches and... Yeah, liniments like you wouldn't believe and oh. Uh, <laughs> they've got a pleasant relief that's better than Pepto-Bismol. And... Uh, Are they still in business? Uh, Raleigh is, Watkins is, yeah, Raleigh sold out to another company that is still in business. McNess is still the one that's going the biggest, and they're 
that have done an awful lot of farming in the U.S. and they go into big stuff like farmers and ranches and stuff like that anymore, not house to house. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I drove for the uh, triple city traction. I won every safety award they had. And uh, then my last, of course, after that, I, I became district manager for Sonatone Corporation. And I came, became owner manager. I came to Elmer in 1961. My offices was in the Merchants Bank building on East West Water Street. Sure. Uh -huh. It was the first one after the, on this side of the railroad overpass, and it was nice there. And they chased me out because I wanted to knock the building down. And that's what makes me so burned up with the city of Elmar. They knock all these beautiful buildings down, just like, just like Langdon's home. Right. They could have made a mint on that with, yeah. with uh, tourists and all. That was, home, it was knock a it down. Beautiful old Victorian. Yeah, sure. They do the stupidest things. Right. And uh, so anyway, uh, let's see. I went. How was that? Oh. Yeah, so I, Mr. Peterson had been here for years, so I took over, he retired, and I had Elmar, before that I had Sayre, and I transferred from Binghamton to Sayre, and then Sayre to Elmar, and I still kept Sayre and Elmar, and so that's fine, but then the 72 flood came, and I was on South Main Street in Elmar, and the flood was five feet over the roof of my building. Thirty thousand bucks went down the Shimon River. Literally in cash or a product or products. Yeah. Everything else. Right. Accounts, re accounts receivable. Right. You name it went down. Sure. It was destitute. Well, uh, thanks to the good Lord, <clears throat> he came through and we made it all right. But. Uh, I sold my business. I was in my mid fifties, and I just lost all. So I sold out anyway. I just couldn't take it anymore. And uh, so then I went diving for Shawn County Transit System, and that's where I retired from 18 years ago last November the third. And I was the first person to retire from Shawn County Transit. I had the first safety award ever given for over 300,000 accident-free miles. Wow. So I have all told over a million miles as a professional driver, but never a chargeable accident. So I'm Unbelievable. Really happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite an accomplishment. And, uh, so yeah, the good Lord's been good though, and uh, saw me all through that uh, Pacific and so forth and so on. And uh, we've we was married, as I say, June 6, 1940, and June 6th this year, Anne and I will be married 63 years. That's great. And we've also uh, got four wonderful kids. Tom lives in Wellsburg with us, and our grandson, er, in the same village as us. And, uh, and our grandson lives two houses from us, his son, Tom Jr. And our youngest son, David, lives in El Cajon, California. Okay. Our oldest son, John Allen, uh, lives in uh, Texas, and he's retired. And then our youngest, Ruth Ann, she's married and lives in uh, Quincy, Mass. So we got her from sea to shining sea, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but. Uh, John, your memory is absolutely great. They give me some guideline questions, but you basically covered most of them in your narrative. But there was just one here that I kind of see that I didn't didn't pick up on. Did you have anything that you did for, for good luck, or did you have a special good luck charm? A lot of uh, veterans had, you know, were somewhat superstitious. No. Uh, Sounds to me like uh, you put your faith in the Lord. I did. Absolutely. So you didn't have a rabbit's foot or anything? No, I did not. I carried a, a, a New Testament with me all the time, and but it was faith. 
Okay. I'll show you in a minute. Now, I think um, you strike me as a guy that always had some self-confidence and ability, but how did the, your service and experiences affect your life? I think you more or less touched on this. Yeah, it changed our whole life pattern. Uh, we often wondered and talked about it, how our lives would have been if the Japs hadn't uh, spoiled everything and uh, it, it had been much different. It was a rough road to hoe for us. Uh, so many times we'd get around and almost see the end of the tunnel and get right to the opening of the tunnel and somebody would yank the rug out from under us and down we'd go again. And then we'd have to start all over again. And, uh, but thank God we came through it and we're fine today, so we've still got a lot to be thankful for. Yeah, we certainly do. I think we just got a few more minutes left. Is there anything else you wanted to add? Well, you were, you're, like I say, I've done several of these, and your memory and your narrative has been one of the best as far as well, remembering specifics and yeah. uh, technical data. So I appreciate it. I've enjoyed it. And so have I. I enjoyed very much doing it. And uh, I hope that. Uh, Somebody will uh, watch it sometime that it might change their lives and keep them from, uh, make them realize that they don't have to use boots and stuff like that. Um, you must have been the minority in the service. I was, yeah. Well, we had a few, yeah. I'd, I'd go out, with, I'd either go alone or go with a buddy that didn't booze, one or the other. And, so you uh, like attend like coffee shops and things yeah. like that as opposed to, uh, yeah, the uh, bars. Like Madison Avenue over here was... Yeah, was, was, peppered with them. Yes. I know one time in Frisco, the boys wanted me to go with them, so I went ashore with them. Boy, they stopped. Here's a bar, let's go in. I said, I don't drink. They said, well, I know you don't drink, but Dean, they said, don't be a party pooper. Come in and have a Coke. Well, I said, to shut you up, I'll go in and have a Coke. Well, I stood just inside the door at the end of the bar, and I drank my Coke, and I said, I, Stink, I'm telling you, just about drove me wild. I hate the stink of that stuff. And so I said, I'll see you guys back at the ship. Wait a minute, I'm not. I said, forget it, thank you. I said, I told you I'd come in and have a Coke. I did, I'm out of here. I'll see you at the ship. So I did. You and I broke up more fights. And, uh, I often wonder why I didn't walk away with my head under my arm more than once. <coughs> uh, different. Uh, branches of the service to get in the fight or something like that. Now, like one day a little skinny British sailor got in a fight with a six-foot Marine. Well, I mean, he told that Marine what he was going to do when he was drunk. He was both drunk. <laughs> right on the street. I, never, I come right up like that and I says to the Marine, I said, don't hit him, you will kill him. Who just under shore patrol came running up. I said, what's the matter? I said, don't mess with the Marine. I said, get rid of that sailor, that British sailor. I said, he's the one that's causing the problem. They grabbed him and hauled him on. Uh -huh. And uh, now, if it had been the other way around, I mean, I'd have taken the other guy's fault, uh, sure. know, side. But, uh, sure, well, you did them both a favor. But, uh, and then we'd get in arguments. Uh, and I'd tell them, listen, you. The Army can't win the war alone. The Navy can't win the war alone. Uh, the Marines can't win the war alone. I says, it takes all of us to do it. And I says, one's no better than the other. And, uh, but that's the way it goes. They, uh, about what really burns me up and burns us uh, veterans of the South Pacific. All the glory goes to Europe, the European war. Granted. They did a fantastic job there. They beat the, the most uh, the most powerful army the world had ever known, Hitler. The best equipped. They beat him. But they had all the allies helping them. Yeah. Who did we have in the Pacific? We had a few Aussies. 
I heard there was one British ship over there. Now, whether that was just hearsay or not, I don't know. <laughs> but we was island hopping. That's altogether a different war. Yes, very different. But that's landing craft. That's hitting the, I know at Hassel Roads, where we, <laughs> where we used to refuel, uh, coming back from there on back to Pearl was safe. So we came back there one day and had a lot of ammunition left. And the captain sent word down. Guys want gun gunnery practice fine. Well, there was an island about a mile from us, and it had 10,000 Japs on it, and we didn't want the island. We did, and they didn't have anything to fight with but their rifles. Well, the Jap rifle was only a 25 caliber. I mean, that's the reason there were so many casualties with us. Whereas when we our bullets hit them, it they was done for, you know. But unless it was, you know, just a glancing blow because ours was powerful and tear them all to pieces. But, so I'll, I'll never forget. I took my 40 millimeter anti-aircraft gun and I laid it right out flat and we opened that up with my buddies and mine. We were throwing 300 rounds a minute out there. Boom, boom, boom. Well, other ships were firing too. When we got done, there was hardly a, a, a palm tree left standing. Smoke and fire was a hundred feet in the air. Oh, it was a mess. I often wonder how many Japs we killed. Right, and this where it wasn't a strategic military. No, we operation. didn't want it, so leave them there. Yeah, if they're still there. That's fine with us. We don't care. And, <laughs> but what what uh, what really amazed me was that I got acquainted with a fellow here a few months ago. It goes to the same church we do. Come to find out, he was on a tank in Okinawa with a flamethrower on it. I was out there on a ship getting the 1,600 Marines in when we got hit. So we was so near and yet so far and I never knew right. him. And he didn't know me until, until a few months uh, ago. <laughs> 60 years later, yeah. Yeah. Still right. hooked up. Well, like I said, we got a few more minutes, John. So any final thoughts? Too many My father was in four years, but he didn't get around like you did. No. You really.